there's a chance for people to come in later if they want, but we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. In my case here at Curtin, they are the Wadju people. I recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters and culture, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. For those who don't know me, I'm Alexander Prent, a research associate at the John Delaney Center. And besides a little research, I wear the main hat I wear is to coordinate the uh, Oscope Geochemistry Laboratory Network, or AGN in short. The AGN was uh, established in order to address a community expressed need for a greater coordination of geochemistry laboratories in Australia. And the AGN aims to establish a national collaborative network of geochemistry laboratories with which we can um, tackle large-scale continental research questions. And uh, an example of that is to support the creation of the Isotopic Atlas of Australia. Now, the AGM project is supported by OSCOPE through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure uh, Strategy, NCRIS. And currently, the uh, AGN project team consists of 13 people, and we hope to expand that in the near future. We, we receive great support from the OSCOPE headquarters, uh, Tim, Tanya, and Joe, and we work closely together with the Lithodat team of Fabian, Wayne, and Moritz to develop OSGeochem. For this team here, the sky seems to be no limit. And besides the creation of a network, the AGN works to promote the national capability and investment in new infrastructure. We support open data initiatives, professional development and end user access to facilities. A lot of our recent efforts have gone into the preservation of legacy data sets and developing of a central repository in the form of OSGeochem. In the last month, we also have been busy with the air to sea grant applications, where we are involved in um, a data platform bid led by Tim Rowling. We're leading a data partnerships bid by Brent McInnes. And our expert advisory groups are finalizing the metadata templates that we started on a few months ago. Then we're working on two papers to be part of a special publication for a journal that we yet have to decide on. There's an AGM webpage under construction. Argon Argon cross laboratory calibration proposal is written to be submitted. Then we've set up a YouTube channel to revisit earlier webinars. And the next one will be about terrain chrome by Macquarie University. Now, without further ado, I've had my talk and um, now we should go on to the main, the core body of the webinar that will be presented by Professor Andrew Gledo, Professor Barry Cohn, and Dr. Samuel Boone. They will talk about the Uni Melbourne Thermochronology Group. That then is concluded with a little a demo by Fabian Coleman of OSGeochem. Thanks everyone, I'll hand over to Andy. Okay, it's my purpose today to uh, give you a brief overview of the thermochronology group at the University of Melbourne, and uh, particularly the fission track group, and to give you some overview of our data resources and sample archives. The uh, fission track group at Melbourne was founded uh, in 1970 um, by uh, Professor John Lovering, who first introduced me to the idea of uh, fission track dating. Uh, which I pursued in my PhD studies. And we've been at the University of Melbourne ever since, uh, except for a 10 year period from 89 to 99, when we were at La Trobe University, 
when I took the chair of geology there. And that was a very important period, and Barry Com's going to talk about that in a little while. Um, but there is more to this than just a story of one group. There are actually three commercial ventures that have had their origin in some way um, related to our research group. That's Autoscan Systems uh, back in the early 80s, Geotrack International in the late 80s, and more recently, Lithodat. There are also now three other laboratories uh, in fish and track analysis around Australia at Curtin University, Adelaide, and University of Queensland, with whom we have uh, excellent uh, relations and with whom we look forward to collaborating uh, much more. So it's, a, it's a, a network even just within the fish and track uh, domain, which is spreading. We've been very fortunate to have substantial research funding over a lot of this period, almost continuously from the Australian Research Council, from the Australian Institute of Nuclear Science and Engineering to cover our neutron irradiations, as long as we did those, up to about 2009. And we've also I've been fortunate to be involved in a number of major research initiatives, starting with a tremendous amount of funding from ESSO Australia in 1980, which really made us into a group. Uh, that was followed by funding, uh, sort of energy research related funding by NERDIC, uh, right through much of the rest of the 80s. Then uh, at La Trobe in the early 90s, we were part of the Australian Geodynamics Cooperative Research Centre that Barry will uh, tell you more about. And then since the late 2000s, we've been involved in the Oscope National um, uh, Collaborative Research Infrastructure uh, System, and of which the AGN that we're now uh, in the present context is part of. There have been tremendous technological developments during this time and also expansion into other related thermo uh, chronology methods, argon 4039 and uh, uranium thorium helium, but particularly the last 15 years of development of automated fish and track systems based on uh, digital microscopy and incorporating laser ablation ICPMS for uranium 238 measurements. Uh, has really dramatically expanded the data uh, component of all this. Having these kinds of facilities and resources has meant that a huge number of people have been associated with the group over the years. Uh, some hundreds of people have been uh, associated in some way or other, either as uh, academics or as researchers, as postgraduate students, as visiting collaborators and, and sabbatical visitors and a, f a few other categories as well, probably. Too many to show here, but this gives you a little bit of uh, an idea of the, uh, the flavor of that. We've also been able to, very fortunate to be able to work in on every continent on Earth, uh, to do fish and track work all around various regions of the world. And that has given us a, a tremendous lot of uh, collaborative linkages uh, with other researchers elsewhere. And it, it all of this, reflects tremendous opportunities that we've had and we've been able to create. And if you put that combination together of funding plus people plus technology plus opportunity, then you're going to generate an awful lot of data and materials. And that's indeed what we've done. Our mineral separate archive uh, collection has about uh, 20,000, more than 20,000 mineral separates in it. At the peak times, um, we've been processing about a thousand rock samples per year, usually a bit less than that, but um, this generates an awful lot of uh, material. And we keep the mineral separates of interest, particularly appetite, zircon and titanite and a few others. Um, but mostly appetites, and this this is the material that is left over after we've prepared our microscope mounts and done the analyses. And this uh, these are stored, they've been stored since the 1980s in these custom-made uh, drawers, and together these there are 39 of these drawers, and they each one holding about um, about 500 samples. So there's, there's somewhere around 20,000 samples. All of these are logged in a manual uh, ledger, and there's a whole lot of different volumes of these. And every sample can be located by the tray number and the row and column number, and all of those records are there. These have been digitized as well, but the, we still keep the paper records. The actual, the other major uh, physical resource is the actual microscope slide mounts, uh, which of which there are similarly somewhere up around 20,000 now, both produced by the external detector method requ requiring neutron irradiation and for the last 10 years by laser ablation 
uh, which doesn't. And these are stored in these uh, uh, storage cabinets. Each drawer in these cabinets holds uh, a thousand slides in 10 trays, each with a hundred slides in it. And there's, there's 16,000, capacity for 16,000 just in that group. And there's an overflow collection, which we store in suspension files in some filing cabinets as well. Again, these are all documented uh, by uh, largely uh, until the last decade by a radiation number. So we know exactly uh, where we can find them. Uh, although these records, again, are variably filled out by the people doing the analyses and of di at different stages of digitization. The sample data um, falls into three categories. The basic sample metadata, which is linked to the actual uh, fish and track age data um, recorded for every grain. There's an age for every grain that's analyzed. For many years, we analyzed about 20 grains. Uh, these days would typically go for 30 or 40 grains because it's, it's relatively easy to do now. And all of the data is summarized there and the track length data as well is summarized uh, in this way. These are just the bin data summarized in a histogram. But if you look at the actual output from Fast Tracks, the latest version of our um, fish and track analysis system, uh, this is a file from a 40 grain analysis. It's about four megabytes in size. And if you actually printed out the ASCII file here, uh, it would be more than a thousand pages of text. So there, and there's an incredible amount of information in there, not all of which we are currently making use of. So there's tremendous opportunities to develop new systems to make uh, measurements with new um, data resources that we don't you know, yet make use of. Um, the volume of data uh, over, the, over that 50 year period, I've just tried to estimate the amount of data. Back when I was doing my PhD in the early 70s, I used to make a, 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 an old IBM punch card for each sample, recording the bare minimum of data to do a fish and track calculation. And that was 64 bytes of data. And that was all. And that was the limit of the technology at the time. Today, we're producing around two to four megabytes of, of recorded data per sample. And we're also recording all of the digital imagery the 3D digital image stacks for every grain of every sample. And that's a further 10 to 20 gigabytes of data for every sample. So the actual um, analytical data is lost in the noise of these really big data sets. And this sort of trend is uh, reflected in the kinds of storage media that we've used over the years. For many years, we used uh, old five and a quarter inch floppy disks. <coughs> And then we went went on to the plastic coated uh, 1.4 megabyte floppy disks. And eventually we had the untold luxury of using zip drives in the late 90s, midnight to late 90s, and at 50 megabytes and later 100 megabytes. In the last 15 years, we've been using these uh, large redundant storage or disk arrays. Uh, each of the, we've got essentially three of these and each with about 16 terabytes of storage. Um, and, and protection against loss. And all of the 32 terabytes of data that we currently have, mostly the digital imagery, is now uploaded to the, the cloud, which um, Sam will tell you about uh, in a little while. And with that very brief introduction, showing you these trends, our data is becoming really important, but also these physical collections are vital and have potential applications for many other researchers. So properly curating and archiving those is a very important uh, thing for us. So with that, I'll pass over to Barry Conn to carry on. Thanks, Andy. Um, well, in the 90s, um, our activities were dominated by the Australian Geodynamics Cooperative Research Centre. Um, this was a partnership between government organisations, um, universities, and uh, some um, industry, mineral exploration industry companies. And the idea here was to develop a geodynamic framework for the Australian continent. And there were several programs within the centre 
And the um, the, the one that we were involved in was a fish and track thermotectonic imaging at continental scale. So this was the vision at the time. And when we started this, um, this work, we had about 700 uh, samples archived in our collection from across Australia. But these also included uh, drill hole samples and samples from sedimentary basins. By the end of uh, seven years, we had 2,750 records um, in our database from Australia. And for this program, we only concentrated on crystalline basement regions. Um, so we, uh, and mainly outcrop samples with a few shallow drill hole um, samples as well. The people who helped us achieve that, that number of analyses were a number of PhD students, um, members of our group, but principally Paul O'Sullivan, who was then a, a research fellow in our group. And the idea here was to develop new tools for integrating large data set and enabling people to visualize it. So the, these are the different terrains that we worked on, these crystalline terrains. And here you can see the distribution of samples from uh, across Australia. You'll see there's a large concentration towards the southeast and various terrains uh, around Australia to a lesser extent. Uh, we, we didn't go out and collect every sample. We had a number of contributions from uh, Geoscience Australia, from uh, different geological surveys, state surveys, um, uh, and particularly West Australia, um, but also um, we would give us appetite separates from their shrimp samples. And so uh, we put all this together and we basically developed a map um, of an interpolated images of an appetite fish and trait map um, of Australia. Now this gives you age here and fish and track lengths, mean fish and track lengths here. But to most geologists, um, these are not like a shrimp age or an argon age. They're not dating necessarily a discrete geological event um, because we, we're dealing basically with a temperature sensitive um, radiometric technique. So, so we need to find a way of making what seems to be an intractable data set somehow meaningful to, to geologists. And so we developed these, um, now someone's overridden me. Yep. yep. Back. Let's go back. Just start playing it again. Yeah. Yep, so here we go. We got to there, yeah. Okay, so we developed this uh, workflow here where we went from the data through to different aspects of, um, of the, the data which needs to be inverted. It needs to be modeled to make it meaningful. So we developed these workflows for thermal history, denudation, paleotopography, where we could image these uh, particular aspects. And as we move down the flow sheet, we're increasing the uncertainties and we are getting further away from the, the basic data. So the result was we were able to produce these time slice images. So we've got here three images of paleo temperature and we're looking here at different times in the past. And what we're seeing is the temperature of the rock. Here we're dealing with the top possibly three to five kilometers of the upper crust. So we're going back to about 110 degrees and this is telling us what the temperature of the rocks were at a particular time. And you can see as we progress through time, how they're basically cooling. The same with denudation and the same with um, paleotopography. To probably make this more meaningful, I'm going to show you a quick time movie. Here we're running through time for over the last 300 million years and we're watching the cooling history from 110 degrees of rocks all around Australia. So I'll play this movie and you'll be able to get an idea of the visualization of this. And so we're running now, you can see the time, the clock's running and you can see the different movement of the rocks cooling um, at different parts of Australia. And you'll see that the, the western part, the old cratons, are, are fairly cool, whereas the eastern margin is still quite warm as we move into the um, Mesozoic. And now we're coming down and you'll see Tasmania is remaining hot all the time. And then as we move into the uh, Cretaceous and we start rifting on the eastern margin, you can see the rocks are starting to cool here. And Tasmania is at the last area to cool in Australia as Australia drifts away from Antarctica. 
and you can see the cooling effect here. So this is the sort of, these are one million year time slices through our modeling. And the modeling here was facilitated by um, Rod Brown and Kerry Gallagher, who were both members of our group at different times. And uh, Kerry had been working on genetic algorithms for modeling. And these were uh, pushed in here as well, as well as um, interpolating the models. So this is the situation as it was about 20 years ago. And I want to emphasize this was just displaying a vision, and um, we've got far more data today in our um, in our uh, data sets, and also the way we model and the way we interpolate data has changed. But this was the vision as in the year 2000. And you can see other things we could visualize, um, sorry, here, would be to say, let's look at smooth long-term denudation chronologies across an area, and so you can see Denudation rates through time over a terrain, first order, varying the heat flow, either we assume a constant heat flow or use the variable heat flow as we see it today in those different areas. And another way that we used was in this case in the, in the snowy mountains of Australia, we're looking across basically a terrain of Paleozoic um, crystalline terrain, mainly granites, granodiorites. We're looking from the, we're looking at here a shaded DEM, a digital elevation model here. And what we're doing here is we've taken all these age elevation profiles and using a uh, this shaded DEM together with simple map algebra, together with our fish and drag data, we're able to visualize the various tectonic blocks within this area. And we can see the faults here and we're visualizing basically what's just a granite terrain. And this was facilitated by um, uh, Simon Cox at uh, CSIRO. And so when we, um, some of the main outcomes from some of this work were some publications about um, visualization and uh, using da large data sets to make what seems to be an intractable set of data more uh, amenable to geological interpretation. So by the early 2000s, we'd started accumulating these very early rudimentary digital records. And we put these in the FileMaker Pro somewhere in these Excel sheets. And from this uh, database here, we could access records, we could look at irradiations, we could access the mounts on which these were in our collection. And this, this, um, this was basically a script which was derived from that. And so at this time, we realized that um, if we were to go into collecting large data sets, we needed to change the way we were doing things because basically we were still doing a very traditional way of collecting data, which was very labor intensive and also involved um, the radiations, which also took time. And so um, uh, we moved on then in, into the next stage, which was basically a, an ARC linkage um, proposal, which was funded to develop a fully automatic system where we could actually make a uh, good use of rapidly developing technologies in microscopy, computing, and imaging. And we would also um, be able to change the way we did things. And I should mention that all the data I've shown you, um, I said, most of that is still available. We still have all the records, we still have the slides, and we still have splits of most of the data. And so with that, I'll move you on to the next chapter and uh, pass you on to Sam Boone. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, so we're now uh, up to the present, and I'll quickly introduce you to our current research group, as uh, all of our members are currently involved in, um, to varying degrees, with a lot of the work that I'll be showing you in the subsequent uh, slides. So as um, Andy and Barry have, have uh, explained, um, over a 45-year history, we've accumulated a vast physical and digital uh, data collection. Um, and there's a number of challenges as we move forward. Um, the first of which is we want to essentially create a new organized and queryable digital database um, for a physical collection. We then want to develop a secure and organized um, way to store our digital data and do it in such a way that we can disseminate those large data sets to colleagues at in, um, different institutions. And then lastly, and, and perhaps most importantly, we want to make the wealth of associated thermochronology data uh, that we produce with these um, from these samples 
uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable via the OzGeochem platform. And we want to we want to solve all of these challenges in such a way that we can minimize the amount of times we have to actually handle data within our lab. Um, and we want to do it in a way that it actually enhances our science, giving us new capabilities to produce um, novel insights about the way our, our planet operates. And so our first step towards uh, addressing these challenges is building an in-house relational database um, to catalog all of our uh, physical specimen that and Andy introduced us to. Um, and this would essentially allow you to, at any, at a few clicks of a mouse, to find any given um, physical resource within our archive. Um, and we're doing this in such a way that uh, not only are we going to be are we archiving information about the our physical collection, but also about the um, the researchers that are producing data, the projects these samples are associated with, um, as well as being able to retrieve information about these samples. Um, we're doing this in such a way that we can actually host the database on the server, meaning that you can access the database via the web. Um, and it also means that it's compatible with mobile and tablet apps, um, which is really important because as we move forward, our aim is to essentially use um, QR code uh, labels on all of our uh, physical specimens, um, which would then allow you to use your phone or app to um, scan that uh, a particular QR code and uh, retrieve information about that sample and other samples associated with it. And um, and to do this, we're, we're minting our entire collection uh, with IGSN numbers or International Geo Sample numbers, uh, which give you these QR codes that are um, unique uh, to each sample. Uh, in addition, our database um, can create and connect with APIs. And this is really critical because the end goal is to connect, essentially marry our physical and digital collections um, by connecting with the OzGeochem platform directly. Um, towards uh, addressing some of our challenges uh, with regards to how we store our digital data and disseminate it, um, as Andy introduced us or, or mentioned rather, that we're storing all our wealth of digital uh, data around 36 terabytes in these hard drive stacks that sit in our lab. But we're also backing these data up on, on the cloud which is great because this um, helps guard against uh, unforeseen and, and um, catastrophic data loss potentially, as well as, uh, and perhaps most importantly, it gives us the capability to actually disseminate these data to um, outside collaborators by essentially giving them a token that allows them to download individual files or whole folders or give access to the entire project if we so wish. Um, and this is quite critical because a number of new challenges have um, arisen over the, the past years and uh, and these new digital solutions, sorry, digital capabilities are allowing us to address these. One of these challenges is how we actually train um, colleagues uh, to perform digital fish and track analyses. Traditionally, um, uh, annually, really, people are coming from all over the world to, uh, to visit our lab. They spend generally multiple months with us and, and learn how to prepare samples. Um, capture images, perform analyses, do laser ablation, mass spectrometry. Uh, but of course, in the COVID era, this is um, not currently possible and it may not be possible for quite a while now. Another challenge doesn't necessarily face, uh, or uh, it's not necessarily a challenge that our group faces per se, but other fish and track groups around the world are facing issues uh, for, for those groups that are still performing conventional fish and track analysis, which requires um, uh, neutron irradiation meaning that you have to send your samples off to nuclear reactors, many of which are now closing, or there are new laws prohibiting in certain countries the transportation of radioactive materials. And um, getting access to other reactors is becoming increasingly difficult due to geopolitical tensions. Um, and so to address these, uh, these challenges, we've um, come up with a new distributed digital fission track analysis stream and a remote training module. The Distributed fish and track anal analysis stream. Um, the idea behind that is that uh, geologists who may want to actually have some fish and track analyses done, they could send us or other um, thermochronology labs within Australia, such as those at Adelaide, Curtin, and UQ. Uh, they can send this physical specimen to us, uh, and then we can capture the images for them for the grains that they're interested in analyzing. We can perform the laser ablation analyses, and then we can disseminate those data back to them um, electronically, which we do via media flux, but of course you could do via cloud store or 
Dropbox or, or a data dissemination tool if you're choosing. Um, and then those researchers could, from the comfort of their home or their office could then perform digital fish and track analysis using the fast track software. Um, this is really exciting because perhaps for the first time, uh, geologists around the world could potentially perform digital fish and track analysis uh, without having any of the required hardware to actually do this, something that has never really been possible before. However, this um, a new challenge arises, and that is how do you train these, uh, these analysts remotely? So to address that, uh, our group's working on um, a digital fish and track training module, which essentially allows uh, or takes um, researchers through a series of um, steps and modules where they can learn how to identify fish and tracks um, and then use the fast track software. They can um, choose their regions of interest, uh, perform automated fish and track counting using the software, determine sea axis orientation, measure DPARs, as well as measuring confined track lengths. Um, and we're already starting to test and improve upon this module with uh, international um, collaborators, as well as um, actually trying out and implementing this distributed uh, fission track analysis stream. And so lastly, I'll talk a little bit about uh, ways in which we're um, aiming to share this, these data uh, associated with our, the samples in our collection um, via the OzGeochem platform. So as many of you tuning in uh, may know, the AGN is teaming up with Lithodat to build the OzGeochem platform, essentially an open, uh, fair-based and, and cloud-hosted data platform for um, Australian-produced geochemistry data from around the globe. Um, and for those of you that are tuning in for the first time, I'd encourage you to check out the AGN's YouTube channel. You can see past webinars there and learn more about um, the work we're doing as well as the AusGeochem platform. So our group is working with uh, low temperature thermochronologists across Australia and with, and with Lithodat as well um, to build uh, method specific data models, particularly or namely for fission track analysis, as well as uranium thorium helium. Um, so that you can upload and synthesize and extract data uh, of these type from um, from the OzGeochem platform. Um, and we're already, even though it's early days, we're already using this to, to do some novel um, science. Uh, one of these projects is we're actually working with uh, Australian thermochronologists from across Australia to essentially bring that 2002 um, regional data set that Barry introduced us to, bring that up to speed, incorporate data from all four of the thermochronology labs in Australia. Um, so including the new analyses that have been done since 2002, as well as incorporating appetite helium data and as well as uh, information from basins, um, in addition to the, the uh, basement um, analyses that we had previously. We're also working on a similar continental scale regional synthesis, looking at the Afro-Arabian Rift system with some other international collaborators. So already, even though it's early days, we're getting to use this new um, tool to do uh, exciting science. So this is the last slide, and I just want to quickly show you how we envision um, uh, how we envision this new laboratory and analytical workflow to proceed uh, in light of these new developments. So, say you return from the field, or perhaps a colleague sends you some information. Uh, sorry, I uh, send you some samples. Um, we already want to record that information into the OzGeochem platform. Um, and we do that via the uh, OzGeochem front end with uh, easy to use user interface. Um, and once you uh, perform some mineral separation and start mounting things and you start producing some additional physical uh, resources, we want to store all that information within our, within our in-house database. Using the um, OzGeochem open API, we then can retrieve that lithological information we've already put into OzGeochem. Because again, we don't want to have to record any single bit of information about any sample more than once. So in this case, we'll look at um, fission track analyses within our lab. So once we've done some analyses, we would have pr uh, produced a number of different types of analytical uh, information, including um, digital fission track analyses, so count data and length data. We would have done some mass spectrometry and, and obtained some isotope concentrations, which we, we reduce through iolite. Um, and then in certain cases, we might also perform some microprobe analyses to get some geochemical data. Those data are backed up both locally in our um, hard drive stacks, which are then also um, duplicated in our cloud storage. And already, if we wish, we could start sharing some of that information 
uh, like the, the digital image stacks with collaborators um, outside of our institution. We're also currently working on a, um, on a scripts to essentially automatically upload all of those uh, export data into the OzGeocom database. And then again, we can then share that information um, to collaborators by, by giving them access to those data within OzGeocom, or um, we can also then publish those data sets uh, as DOIs. Um, and to tell you more about uh, OzGeocam and what we can actually do with these types of data once um, once they're in the database, I'll hand you over to Fabian Coleman. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Sam. Um, okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks for, for Andy, Barry, and Sam to show already all about the data. What we show now, um, I will focus on the Australian data we have already in our Steocam. And um, as you, as Alex already introduced, uh, our Steocam, what we do is that we are trying to connect all Australian geochemistry laboratories. And Sam showed already we're having now more um, actual some chronology labs here in Australia. We have Stan Glory's group in Adelaide. We have Martin Danisic's group in Curtin. Um, and of course, we have Melbourne Uni. And then we have Renji um, in Queensland. And they will all join the um, Osteocam network and contribute data. So we will increase the some chronology data produced by Australian labs and display them via the Osteocam platform. Um, to show you quickly a, a brief introduction into the difference what we do as an OSGEOCAM platform um, compared to portals is where, where there are a lot of portals out there which bring which are great ways to find data but all this data usually comes from different WMS feeds that means all the data coming with their own standards their own um, formats the fields of different units so the approach we do we having all data we put in we have a massive um, relational database we store all different kind of data types, but what we do, we standardize them all. We bring all the units together. We make sure all the fields talk to each other, that they all use the same standards and um, that they actually can start communicating with each other and having that system set up. Then we are able to do these live cross data analytics, which I will show you in a, in a minute. So yeah, that's an overview of the um, AFT ages we currently have here in the OSTEOCAM platform. And um, I tried to put a live demo in, but to make sure it's not falling apart, I, I recorded it and I will show you a video. So that's the uh, um, data. We have a lot of data coming from the Melbourne um, Uni Lab, so on the East Coast. So we can change the different, different views. So if you want to get a quick idea of the topography, we can look here, we see the hill shade, we see all the data here around Sydney. You can go on a point to get the information, um, like we store the latitude, elevation, name, what method has been used, the age, the grain. And then of course it depends what kind of data has been provided by the authors, but all the data which is in there is all getting stored in there. And the nice thing is a reference. Every sample has a reference. You click on it, it brings you automatically to, to the actual paper. You can download the paper, you can do more reading. So that's a really cool feature. Um, but if you want to do uh, more analytics on the fly with the data within there, we can do a multi selection. So in that case, um, we can draw a polygon just across the data we're interested in. That's a transect here from the coast um, to the hinterland. Um, and then it calculates on the fly. It takes all these points, takes all the values in and creates, for example, age histogram. The nice thing is we can also, you can interact with your data. You can adjust the bin size um, depending on um, yeah what you want to see. As you see, the bin size change massively your, your spikes. Um, yeah, we can do age elevation plots. Every single data point has elevation. So if it's not provided by the authors, what we do is we use an API on a high resolution DM and we make sure every single um, sample point has an elevation assigned based on, on the location if it's not provided by, by the author of the studies. And a very nice feature for the um, fission track data is we, we can create these um, mean track lengths versus age plots 
on the fly as well. You can adjust your, your y-axis, your mean drag length. Um, and yeah, you can look, you can see boomerang plots in some cases, so that's quite nice. Um, as I said, it's really interactive. You can just jump, you can do the same at a different area. So we go down here, select another area. Again, really just the points you're, you're interested in creating again, mean track lengths versus age plots. Can adjust. And that's for, for small areas you're looking in. But of course, we can do the same for, for, for larger areas if you want to see if there are any patterns or what, whatever we can see. So here we just select a large chunk on, on the east coast of Australia. And all that data is being read out of the database and on the fly all these graphs are, are created. And um, you can see that there are many more points in there. And again, we you can see patterns. You and and it's not just from one study. Whatever data comes in, all the data can be handled the same way. So there's no differentiation. Um, yeah, age elevation plots, histogram plots, and we are creating uh, many more. We have a radial plot already um, ready to go. So there's a lot more plots being developed. We're working together with this expert group. So the Depending on the request, we will develop more plots. And the nice thing is, as I said, because all the data is together, we can combine it with different kind of data. Let's say we, we put in all the geocron data for an area on top of the of the um, fission trade data. And again, you just select an area you're interested in. And that's what I said is difference to, to a portal. You can start analyzing it across different data types. So in that case, it takes all these different data types and creates um a plot um, on the flight compares all the data, reads it in. Again, elevation are assigned to all these different data types, for example, and it creates um, an age elevation plot. And we can spin that further. We can then create multi thermochronometers, etc. So that that's I think to to give you an idea what we can do, and there will be many more functionalities coming in future. But I think it's a really powerful tool to give you a quick idea. All these graphs you can export as SVG files. You can then edit them and get them ready for publication. Um, the other nice thing is that's an area here in, in Alaska where we have some data from, from William Craddock, a paper they published with a lot of details. You can see we have here uranium chlorine, uh, a deep power provided. And the nice thing is we store all data. So for each sample, we also store all single grain information if it's provided. So for example, you click on, on a sample point, then you can also get a age distribution histogram for, for single grain data. Um, it's also calculated on the fly. Um, same for age versus deeper. All your, all your mean track lengths can be in there. And you can export them also. You have all parameters there. If you want to remodel a sample, you can just download the files. And um, yeah, you can rerun your models. What we're aiming for now in the future is we, we want to we, we want to create these dashboards. So one board where you have then a table of all your selected data. Um, you can decide which um, graph you want to look at. So you can use pull down menus. You can swap graphs for other graphs. Um, and I think that would be really nice to then visualize your data and give you a compact understanding of the area you're trying to investigate. And another thing is we are having uh, we're using that on on Lizard Surfer on on our platform, but which is free for the whole academic community. Is um, we are digitizing all these different types of thermal histories, and uh, the labs here in Australia, like the Melbourne Lab and and Sam and and his um, the PhD students, they have already had the digitizing a lot of large data sets. Plus, Dane Glory um, in Adelaide provided a lot of um, digitized thermal histories from from the Tian Shan. Mountain. So what we do, we standardize them, and they're all digitized and stored in one data table. And then the nice thing is you can then analyze this and looking at patterns. For example, we can query a time. So if we query a time, let's say 100 MAs, here you can see uh, on, on the lower right a uh, schematic graphic of a pollen basin and, and the hinterland. And we see these, um, at, let's say 100 MAs, there is heating happening to that sample um, in the foreland basin and in the hinterland we have asymmetric um, cooling. But now we want to see, okay, what happened 50 MA? So we type 50 MA's in. And on the fly in the database, these values are calculated, the thermal gradients, and can be displayed by scales on, on the map. So for example, we have an interface in the map. That's the data for provided from Tian Shan, from, from Stain's group. 
let's say 50 MAs, you get all the information on the top right, what model has been used, um, what the temperature is at the time you're looking at um, the thermal gradient as uh, a temperature gradient. And you see on the graph on the bottom where you are, then you type in 100 MAs and it calculates it on the fly and displays it based on the magnitude. So that's something we, we, we provide as well. And I think it's a very powerful tool then to, to look at patterns in, in a region. Okay, so yeah, that's all for my side. There's much more to come, so stay tuned. And I am passing back to Andy. Thanks, thanks, thanks Fabian. Um, I think it only remains, to, if anyone wants to ask any uh, questions, the chat is there. <laughs> But uh, it's lovely to see so many uh, familiar names in the participants list. And uh, it's lovely to, that all of you from around the world could uh, join us at probably terrible hours of the day. But anyway, it's very good that you did. <laughs> I thought that some of you might do it on the recording later, but it's lovely to see you. Yeah. So if anyone has questions, we can, uh, I, I don't know if, if, Alex, if you've been monitoring. We haven't had any questions yet in the chat. There is, um, we're recording this uh, webinar. So if mm. uh, your colleagues want to have a look at the webinar, then please visit the YouTube channel. You can put that into the, into the chat. There's also the recordings of the first and the second webinar. Okay, so if, I guess if there are no no questions, um, thank. Okay, so if, I guess if there are no no questions, um, thank you very much for joining. Oh, I have a question, Andy. Yep. Okay. Yep. Could you put a dollar value on the collection that you have in terms of if you had to start from scratch and put it together, what it would be worth? Well, many, many millions of dollars, um, I, tens of millions, probably. I, I know that the, the funding we had from the AGCRC during the 90s, uh, where we processed, well, a part of that was, was reanalyzing older data, but we reprocessed probably getting up to couple of thousand samples, maybe 1,500 new samples. Anyway, it, it, it took us seven years and it cost about a million dollars to do in, in 1990s um, dollars. So, you know, that would be worth an awful lot more now. And if you go back over the, I guess the research funding we've had over that period is probably somewhere between 20, 10 and 20 million dollars and that's that's the output from it so if you had to go and collect it all again that would be it yeah i think we need to emphasize andy that what we have now we regard as critical research infrastructure this yeah. is this is the basis on which many more things can be done and it exists and we're making it accessible so we view this as research infrastructure and that is part of what oscope is about yeah and and both the um, you know, the, the properly curated and, and archived you know, physical collections. I mean, if somebody wants to work on on uranium lead in appetites, for example, you know, where the place to come, <laughs> and and many of the other fish and track labs around the world are, are drowning in appetite samples. So uh, th there are a tremendous lot of things that could be done, which were different to the original purpose. I mentioned the the just the sheer amount of data that is is not immediately accessible that, that fast tracks produce produces. If you wanted to actually look at the location of every single fission track uh, within a grain um, or within a whole collection of grains, that is all recorded. It's like a micro GIS system that has the physical locations to the micron of every fission track that is analyzed and counted. And that, it, that means that there are new approaches that could be done to look at look for statistical variations in, in uranium concentration, which is not obvious to the eye. 
and not obvious to the user, but you might be able to tell that there is actual heterogeneities in uranium distribution uh, that can be detected statistically. And some, you know, Rich Ketchum is working on on developing just such a, a proposal. So we've got a we've got a sort of a rich data format now, a, a an expanded advanced data format that you can export from Fast Tracks version three that enables you to get all of that kind of extra data. Now we, we don't we don't yet know how useful that's going to be. We don't really know how useful it is going to be to get a a, a consistent DPAR and DPER value on every uh, fission track that is ever measured. Uh, this this is something way beyond the very simple sampling that has been um, undertaken in the past with manual measurements. So I, I'm just really looking forward to the exciting things that could be done with, with people around the world having clever ideas and wanting some data to test them on. Um, this system should uh, should provide for it. And of course, although the AGN is, is Australian-based and that's our primary focus is the Australian data set, all of our other data sets are going up, as Sam indicated as well, from those various parts of the world eventually. And of course, other groups around the world are also um, putting their data sets into, uh, into Lithodat <clears throat> so that this will be a fantastic basis for going in and doing the next generation of work. Um, one other thing, when you see a, 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 the Australian data collection plotted on a map where each point is about 50 kilometres in diameter, <laughs> in reality, it looks like an awful lot of data. But when you get down on the ground, uh, even that sort of, you know, several thousand data points across the continent, the average spacing of those is, is of the order of 40 kilometres or so and much denser in some parts of the continent than in others. But there is an awful lot of really interesting geology going on out there that we haven't begun to address with these uh, legacy data sets. So I, it's, um, it, I think there's some, an incredibly exciting time ahead and I just wish I was 30 years younger. <laughs> just to add to what Andy mentioned, um, with that Australian, th those images I showed you, as, as I mentioned, that was done 20 years ago. It didn't have a lot of things in it, which we could put in now. And we smoothed a lot of those interpolations. Like we never showed you what happens when you go across a fault. <laughs> um, and there's various ways you can deal with that, but we didn't do it, but we could. We've got everything there. So these, these things can be upgraded and we can add new forms of data, which we never collected with that data set. And that would change things quite a lot. But the fact, the fact is that the infrastructure is there, which we can do. And, and the more advanced the uh, the automated systems become, the easier it will be to go back over some of those uh, legacy slide collections, for example. Uh, there's no reason we couldn't go back and reanalyze many of those old uh, slide mounts um, and collect modern generation fish and track data. I think we have some exciting times ahead of us. And um, with that, I think we should close this meeting today. Thanks for the presenters. Great job, everyone. And uh, let's see you and others in uh, four or five weeks with the fourth webinar on Terrain Chrome from Macquarie University. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Alex. See you. See you all. Bye. Take care.